see what he was doing. It was so dark in this cave. So he pulled out a match and... <laughs> ah, now he could see. He grabbed the date. <laughs> Something tasted very weird about this date. He brought the light of the flame from the match close to the date. <coughs> he saw that the date had little tiny worms in it. Oh! <laughs> he threw that date out. Hopefully the next date will be better. The match was running out. <laughs> Took another date. <laughs> mm -mm. Took a look. Oh, there was more worms in the next date. That was two for two. He was getting nervous. One was an accident. Two, that's a pattern. I don't know what's going on here. He was very hungry. But every time he looked at the date, he saw that there were worms. He had a decision to make. He looked at the flame. He looked at the dates. He looked at the flame. He looked at the dates. He blew the flame out, and in the darkness, he enjoyed the rest of the dates. Now, do you think that just because he blew out the light, that the worms were not there? The worms were definitely there. Just because he didn't see it, didn't mean it didn't exist. But for him, ignorance was bliss. Many people do not want to know the truth. They rather leave, live in ignorance because in ignorance, well, you know, what I don't know doesn't hurt me. True or fake, true or false, real or fake. Can anybody read that? What does that say? If you, if, if you see it with one pair of eyes, you'll see real. If you look with another pair of eyes, you see fake. The question is, what is reality? What is real? What is fake? What is true? What is fake? In this world, people like to talk about fake news and all that stuff. Fake news. People like talking about it. A matter of fact, Facebook shut down hundreds of profiles because they were pushing fake news articles. And so they were shutting down all these Facebook accounts, all these Twitter accounts, because they didn't want to promote things that were fake. What is true? What is fake? Can something be both real and fake at the same time? Can something be true and false at the same time? When it comes to reality, when it comes to the truth, when it comes to God's word, there can only be one truth. That's why this series is entitled, Tell Me the Truth. We want to know only the truth that God has for us. How do, we, how do we determine what is true and what is fake? The Bible says in Psalm chapter 119, verse 105, it says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Many people are busy blowing out that light because they don't want to see the truth. They rather live and enjoy ignorance. But God's word, his Bible, is considered to be the light that can show us the truth, to show us the right way to live. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 1 through 4, it talks about how the people wanted to go to Jesus and were asking him a question. It says, then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him, testing Jesus, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather. For the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites. 
You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Pause right here. So, so the people came to Jesus and wanted a sign. They wanted to know if Jesus was real or if he was a fake Messiah. Show us a sign and we will believe. Jesus says, wait a minute. You can, you can look at the weather. You can look at the sky and see the color of the sky. And you can tell what weather is going to be. Even back then, before they had the weather channel and before they had the weather app, people could tell what type of day it was going to be. They could just look and they could see it. He says, look, you can tell by all those things, but you cannot tell the signs of the times. And then he says in verse 4, in verse 4, he says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Jesus is saying to them, you want to have a sign to know whether or not I am real or fake? A wicked generation looks for a sign. Many times people want a sign from God. They want a sign to tell them, to tell them the truth. They want, it's like, they could read, they may read it in the Bible, they may see it, they may hear it being preached from the word, but unless they get a sign directly from God, they refuse to accept it. Jesus says that a wicked group of people look for a sign. But wait a minute, weren't there people in the Bible who asked God for signs? Didn't God give signs in the past? Absolutely. But that's not what God wants. He doesn't want to communicate with signs. There are still people today that will refuse to believe that Jesus is real. Many people today believe that God is fake. And unless there is a sign, they don't want to believe it. Am I right? There are that's why in schools today, they're promoting uh, evo the evolutionary theory. And boy, is it a theory. People are trying to say that God isn't real, that God didn't create the world. They're trying to say that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. He was just an ordinary man. There are people who are arguing and saying that this is not true. It is fake. But Jesus says, I'm not interested in giving you a sign. Matter of fact, you already got a sign. You have the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah? How is that a sign? Well, Jonah, he preached. He delivered his message. He didn't even want to preach, but the message was shared. And Jonah, in fact, was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. Similar how Jesus was in the grave for three days and three nights, but he resurrected. But still today, people don't believe that. Many people think, well, why doesn't God make himself obvious today? Why doesn't God just show up, do a miracle, and then people would believe? Jesus is calling it even from then. And he says, don't worry about that. A wicked nation looks for a sign. There are people, even if they saw a sign, they wouldn't believe. Now, hold up. Who's talking here? It's, who's talking here? Who was is, who is asking Jesus the question? The Pharisees and Sadducees. Wait a minute. Didn't they already have signs? By this, this is Matthew chapter 16. By Matthew chapter 16, Jesus had already healed people. He had already cast out demons. He was already performing signs. So they said, we want another sign. When people look for signs, no sign is good enough. That's why Jesus says, you don't need no more signs. I'm not giving you any other signs. There are people today who are being blessed by God, and God is doing things for their lives, but yet people are not recognizing them as signs of God's providence. People are ignoring them. They want no interest in God. I remember uh, one of my friends, one of my friends, uh, me and him were talking, and he was an atheist. An atheist. Ironically, his name was Christian. But Christian had become an atheist. 
And he says, you know, after going to school and after learning things in college, I don't believe in God anymore. Look at what the Bible has to say about this. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In other words, God's word, God's message about his sacrifice is power to some, but to others, it's foolishness. People say, why don't you prove, what can you show me, what what can you say to me to prove that God is real? I am not interested in proving that God is real. I am not interested in disproving somebody's belief that he is fake. For some people, it will be foolishness. But the Bible says in verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Aren't people still disputing the age of the world still to this day? Where are these people? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? God takes what the world believes in and makes it look foolish. But for the people of the world, they look at God as though he's foolish. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. When the world relies on their own wisdom, when the world relies on looking for evidence, It does not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. God takes the light in using what people call foolishness to save others. You would think that Paul, who wrote this uh, book, 1 Corinthians, would say, no, 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 don't call the word of God foolishness. Don't call the message foolishness. Let me tell you that it is real, it is true. No, he says, now I'm going to embrace that term, foolishness. I like that. Go ahead, call it foolishness. God, it pleases God through the foolishness of this message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews, they request a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. Show me, give me logic. Have you ever tried to prove God logically? Have you ever uh, looked for a sign that God is real? Some people look for a sign. Some people look for logic, wisdom. But God is not interested in any of that. But we, verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. God is not debating that his truth is foolishness. You want to think it's foolishness? Go ahead. I'm not going to try to disprove it otherwise. Keep thinking that what I have to say is foolish, because I'm going to use this foolishness to save somebody. I'm going to my, God's wisdom, God's or God's foolishness is better, wiser than anything that the world has to offer. I remember how some people were trying to prove God through logic. I remember I was sitting in a room with a bunch of people, a bunch of uh, young adults, and uh, one guy was getting really heated. He believed in God, and he was upset that one of the friends in the group did not believe in God. And he started getting really loud and mad. And he says, how can you not believe in God? Are you stupid? Are you really stupid? Come on, look at the world. Look at the space. Look at how many stars are in the sky. He started going into all the big logical debates that many people give. And he started talking about, don't you know you can look at archaeological uh, artifacts? And he started getting really upset. And the, the guy who was an atheist in the room started to kind of pull back, and he started to get upset back and uh, and and the room got very tense because they were trying to use logic and then somebody in the group said well why don't you ask wayne he's a pastor ask him Ah. 
And so the guy looked at me and says, oh, what, what do you think? I really don't care what you have to think. I don't care if you're a pastor. I, I don't believe in God. And I told them, that's okay. I'm not going to try to prove that God is real to you. And he's like, what? What do you mean? I can't prove that he's real. What? what do you mean you can't prove he's real? Why do you believe it? And that sparked a conversation between him and I. And the room got calm. It no longer was intense. And every time the other guy, the loud guy, started to talk, he said, hey, stop. I'm listening to him. I want to hear what he has to say. And we talked about God. I wasn't interested in proving that he was real. I just wanted to share who he was. Rather than trying to prove Jesus, share Jesus. Share the character of who Christ is. You see, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 to 21, for we knew, did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are many people who think that the Bible is a book filled with fairy tales. They think that the book of Genesis is just a big allegory. There are even Christians today who do not believe that God created the world in, in a week. There are people out there who are who are always diminishing the word of God. However, the Bible says, we don't believe in made-up fairy tales, fables, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. What is he talking about there? There was a moment where Peter, James, and John saw Jesus walk into a mountain and glory hit. As a matter of fact, Jesus started shining. And it was an amazing event when they heard God's voice saying, this is his son. They said, we're eyewitnesses that God is real, that Jesus is real. But that's good that they were eyewitnesses. What about us? We're not eyewitnesses. So how can, we're going to just take their word for it? Verse 19. So we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first. That no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This verse it describes how the Bible was inspired. The Bible actually isn't, an, isn't a dictation by God. There are many people who think that the Bible is word for word, God saying it and them writing it down like a secretary. That is not what took place. The Bible says that, it, that, the, that when the holy men spoke, it was because they were moved, not dictated, but moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moved their hearts, inspired them, whether it was through the thoughts of their mind, whether it was through a vision or a dream. However God inspired them, then they would write. That's why you can read passages of Scripture, like in the book of Psalms, where David talks about his anguish and hardship and his stress. That wasn't the words of directly of God. It was the words of David inspired by God, moved by God. That's why you have the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. If this was a dictation by God, those four books would have been identical. However, the four books are different. Why? Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all are different individuals with different uh, ideas, with different uh, perspectives. I'll give you an example. If today, after my message today, I tell you, everybody, I want you to write down a summary of what you heard. 
would you would you write the same exact thing that she writes? No, unless you're cheating. Unless you're doing some sort of plagiarism, there's no way you're going to write the same thing. Why? Because you two are different. You both may have been inspired by the message, but you guys are going to have your own perspective. Now, the inspiration that happens here was a supernatural, spiritual inspiration. But still, at the end of the day, when they were inspired, the individuals wrote. And I praise God for that. You see, God could have written the Bible in one day. Am I right? However, these uh, 66 books were written over a time span of, one th of about 1,500 years. Now, this is pretty amazing because if God wanted it, he could have wrote it in just one day. But instead, God writes it over thousands of years using the prophets, and somehow all of them are in harmony. They are written by 40, about 40 different people. These people were kings, shepherds, scientists, attorneys, general, fishermen, priests, physician, so many different people, so many different perspectives, but yet it all came in harmony. That just shows the power of the Holy Spirit guiding the entire process. Many people feel like, well, why don't we just reject the Old Testament? Some people say, we'll only read the New Testament. Some people say, well, I only want the Old Testament. But you see, the two go hand in hand. You see, because the Old Testament is prophesying about the coming of Jesus. But the New Testament is reliant upon the Old Testament. Remember, we just read that nothing is of a private interpretation Everything needs to be backed up with other passages of Scripture. In other words, when Moses wrote the law, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, when he wrote that, the, that laid a foundation. So anything else that was written had to be in alignment. Anything that was not in alignment could not be considered God's word because God would not contradict himself. And so... Every single letter, every single book that was written after the first books had to be in alignment. That's why the historical books uh, detailing the story of Israel. That's why the poetry books, the prophetic books all had to be in alignment. And so the New Testament cannot stand by itself because nothing is of private interpretation. Matter of fact, when Peter wrote that statement, in that passage that we just read, when Peter wrote this statement in 2 Peter 1, chapter, verse 16 to 21, that was not considered Bible yet. He was still living. He was still writing. But he said nothing that we say can be of private interpretation. It has to be backed up by the Scripture. He was talking about the Old Testament, talking about the Scriptures of God, the Law and the Prophets. And so when Peter wrote his book, it had to be in connection and had to be in agreement with what was already written. And so all of the New Testament had to agree with the Old Testament or else it would never have been considered canon or Bible in the first place. But now, but ever since that time, after the they wrote the last book, after Revelation was written, after the whole uh Bible was complete. Then what? See, the Bible was originally written in three languages. It was written, the Old Testament was written primarily in Hebrew in a few passages. It was also wrote, written in Aramaic. And the New Testament was written in Greek. Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. However, we are not able to read it. We can't read Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. So it had to be translated. So let me just give you a brief history of the translation of the Bible. So first up, we have the Old English translation from 8700. Uh, only parts, only bits and parts of the Bible were translated into Old English. Then Middle English translation, the 1380. John Wycliffe began translating from Latin into English with Nicholas of Hereford and John Purvey. 
one of the statements he was made, it helpeth Christian men to study the gospel in that tongue in which they know best Christ's sentence. He believed in order for people to study the Bible, they had to read the Bible in their own language. Makes sense. See, there was a time where the Bible was not in the common language, and so they just had to take other people's word for it. And so they started translating. In 1525, William Tyndale translated the New Testament from Greek to English. Then from 1535, Miles uh, Coverdale completed a, and published the first completed Bible in English. Many people think that the King James Bible was the first English Bible. It wasn't. In 1537, you have the Matthews Bible, which was uh, very similar to the uh, previous. In 1539, you have the Great Bible, a revised Coverdale Bible. In 1560, you have the Geneva Bible. This is Protestant scholars using Tyndale's work and original languages. In 1568, you have the Bishop's Bible. This is a revision of the Great Bible that was in 1539. Then in 1582 and 1609, you have the Reims and Dua translation, uh, respectively. In 1611, you have the Authorized Version, otherwise known today as the King James Version, a revision of the Bishop's Bible. So the King James Bible was a revision of the Bishop's Bible with the aid of the original languages and the work of Tyndale, commissioned by King James I and translated by a number of Bible scholars. See, there was a lot of Bibles, and the King James was based on another version of the Bible. Then, in uh, 1885, you have the Revised Version. This was a revision of the Authorized Version, incorporating more recently discovered manuscripts and more modern language by a group of British and American scholars. So those were the modern English translations. And then we have the 20th century English translations. In 1901, you have the American Standard Version, a revision of the authorized version coming from the American scholars' participation. In 1903, the New Testament in modern speech, R.T. Uh, Weymouth attempted to render Greek grammatical constructions carefully. In 1937, Williams' uh, New Testament, Charles B. Williams attempted to translate into English the nuances of the Greek verb. And me studying Greek verbs in college, man, those Greek verbs really can make a difference of the meaning of a verse. In 1952, the Revised Standard Version, a revision of the American Standard and the King James by an international translated committee. In 1971, you have the New American Standard Bible a revision of the American Standard Version with a goal of maintaining the literal translation. In 1979, you have the New International Version, one of the most popular, by evangelical scholars incorporating the most recent textual evidence. In 1982, you have the New King James Version. This is a modernization of the King James Version based on the original language text available to the King James translators. And in 1989, you have the new Revised Standard Version. Translation Committee updates the Revised Standard Version. Now, I skipped uh, uh, several, but I just took the main ones just to kind of give you an overview of this. Why am I saying this? Now, some of you know more than one language. Raise your hand if you know more than one language. Many of you know more than one language. If you, let's say, know both English and Spanish, and you find a book written in Spanish and you wanted to translate it into English, would you do a perfect job translating it? Absolutely not. What about if somebody else translated it? Would they translate it the same way, same exact way that you translate it? No. Why? You both know English and Spanish. Well, how would it not be the same exact translation? You guys are two different people. You guys have different ways of saying things. And so you might be translating the same message, but you, have diff you use different words, different synonyms, and things like that. So what I'm trying to say here is that there is no English version that you could say is the perfect translation. What you need to do in order to kind of feel out, unless you know, unless you know, See, you have many different versions, but unless you know Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic, you have to be able to read multiple different versions. 
when you read multiple different versions, see how this committee translated it. See how that committee translates. See how this committee translates. And when you get a, an idea of how many different people translate one passage, then you can have a better understanding of the general consensus of what that verse means. The same way if somebody were to translate a book from Spanish to English, if I want to get a general understanding of what that book was, I would read multiple translations of that book to get a general idea of what it is. And so the idea is if you can't read Hebrew, if you can't read Greek, the point is read something. The point is don't get caught up with, well, I read this version or that version. Read a version. Read the Bible. Because at the end of the day, the Bible, Jesus says, my spirit will guide you into all truth. When you read God's word, no matter who translated it, you will be able to get an understanding of God's truth. And I encourage you to read multiple versions. Matter of fact, today it's so easy. You can download this app, version. Some of you have version. Uh, on your app, you could just uh, download it and you can select any, almost any version on that app and you can read the Bible. You can compare it side by side. You might see that one version says it very weird. Then you see another version, see what it says. They compare the, the notes together and see what the Bible is saying. You see, God gave us advice through his disciple John. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. He warned them. He says, do not believe everything you hear. Many people may read the Bible and says, I don't believe it. Good. Don't believe everything you read. But test it. Compare it. Compare scripture with scripture. Compare it. Look at it into your life. You know, I was talking with one guy. Another uh, friend of mine who uh, decided to leave God. He decided to leave God because he didn't like how the Bible was against his lifestyle. He said, I don't even know if God is really real. And again, I'm not about trying to prove that God is real. A wicked, perverse nation seeks after a sign. So I'm, not, I'm wasting my time if I try to prove it through logic. If I try to prove it through a sign. Let God use his foolishness to confound the wise. And so I told him, all I want you to do is I want you to simply read it. That's it. I just want you to read the Bible for 30 days. That's it. Just 30 days. Just read a little bit at a time, a paragraph at a time each day. And if that doesn't change your life, then okay. But if you read it with an open mind and you search it, then maybe, just maybe, God will become real for you. He said, I got to think about it. I don't know. The next day, I spoke to him again. He said, Wayne, I thought about what you said. And I decided to not read it. I decided not to read it because I'm afraid that it's going to convict me that my life is wrong. See, he wasn't looking for evidence. He was looking for a way out. Many people who ask for a sign aren't looking for evidence. They're looking for a way out. They're not interested in God. Because if somebody's interested in God, the Bible says, when you seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. In Isaiah 8, verse 20, it says, to the law... And to the testimony. If they don't speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. 
In other words, when you read the Bible, you got to compare the Bible to the Bible. Anything in the New Testament, you got to compare it to the Old Testament. Anything in the Old Testament, any prophetic words, you got to compare it to the Torah. You got to keep comparing scripture with scripture. And if it doesn't match up, then there's a problem. It says to the law and to the testimony. The law, Torah, testimony, the writings. In other words, the Bible. If they don't speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. In other words, if you want to know what is true and what is fake, compare it to the Bible. And again, you might say, well, I don't believe in the Bible. That's okay. I don't expect you to believe it right away. But if you are struggling with your belief in the Bible, I encourage you to simply read it. We're going to be going together for these next two weeks. And I encourage you to just simply have an open mind to read the Bible along with us. Just study it on your own. After you get the scriptures, write it down. Study it when you get home. Compare the scriptures with scriptures. And if you find that the scriptures... Or if you're reading it, maybe, just maybe, it might become real for you. You see, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. So, and in righteousness... That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, the Bible is saying, Timothy, uh, uh, Paul was writing to Timothy and was saying, even before it was considered Bible, he was saying about the Old Testament, he was saying all the scripture is good. All the scripture has profit. Paul wasn't rejecting the Old Testament. He was saying, no, it's all profitable. It's all good for you. It's profitable for doctrine. In other words, it's profitable to show me what I should believe in. Teaching. For a proof to correct my life. For instruction in righteousness. How to live. That the man of God may be complete. If you want to be complete, if you want your life to be better, read the word. It's thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you want to have a better life, the Bible is what we've got to read. So, if you're struggling today with whether or not the Bible is real or fake, true or false, all you got to simply do is read it. I'm not here to prove that it is real. Because Jesus said, a wicked nation looks for a sign. But you see, a righteous person seeks after God. Are you looking for a sign or are you looking for God? If you're looking for God, you will find him when you search for him with all your heart. Let me end with this story about a man who, uh, who decided that he was going to write a book to disprove God. And as he was in this mission to disprove God, writing this book, he started writing the book. And as he was writing the book, he had to do some research. And as he was doing the research to disprove God, something strange started to happen to him. He started to get convicted by the very stuff he was reading. He was reading the Bible to disprove God. And as he was reading the Bible, he started to get convicted by God. And although he started off writing a book to disprove God, he started to, instead he started to write a book about God. That book, I, I believe, from what I read, turned into the book called Ben-Hur. And Ben-Hur later on was made into many motion pictures. And it's still to this day... Nobody, no other movie has beat that movie in terms of Academy Awards. It was a, a, it all started from a guy who wanted to disprove God. But in his effort to disprove God, he started reading the Bible. And by reading the Bible, he fell in love with who God was. So today, I encourage you to keep coming to this series. Study the Word of God with me. Because if you study the word, even if you're skeptical, God's word, if you search with all your heart, will prove itself real within you. Let us pray. 
Father God, thank you so much that you have given us your true word. It is true. So tell us the truth. Today, maybe somebody is here and they're not sure if you are real. They're not sure if the Bible is reliable. But the fact that they're in this room today means that they're searching for you. And we know that when we search for you, you're not playing hide and go seek with us. You'll come out and you will embrace us when we seek for you with all our hearts. Let us find you in these two weeks. Show us who you are. Show us, tell us the truth, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.